Hello everybody. Uh, today we're going to be talking about friends and peers in adolescence and emerging adulthood. So, here we go. The nature of adolescent peer groups. So, peer groups and friendships change quite a bit during adolescence. Um, friends are very important in adolescence. There's a sharp increase during adolescence in the time spent with peers versus adults. So as children, um, children spend a lot more time with adults than with same age peers. And then um, time with peers increases quite a bit during adolescence. Nearly half the people a teen names as being important in his or her life are the same age as the teen. Again, peers being um, very important in a teenager's life. Peer groups begin to function much more often without adult supervision, right? Uh, adolescents start to go to the mall by themselves without an adult or go to the movies, things like that. And then there's increasingly more contact with peers of the opposite sex. So while friendships in late childhood tend to be more based on shared activities, um, adolescents are more likely to be friends with people who they feel can support them um, and give them kind of intimacy in terms of um, relationships, sharing uh, details of their lives and being there to support each other. In terms of the change in friendships during adolescence, it's brought on by a number of things that are changing. Um, from childhood to adolescence. So cognitive changes, right, are happening as a individual moves from childhood to adolescence, thinking becomes more abstract and complex, and that influences the nature of relationships. They can be deeper um, and more uh, complex types of relationships as opposed to just, um, oh, you like to play soccer, so do I. Um, sexual maturity, also is happening and that's changing um, the way in which peers interact with each other. Um, and gender plays a role. Um, girls tend to have more intimate friendships where boys still tend to emphasize shared activities. Moving into emerging adulthood, um, intimacy becomes more of a key component in friendships. Um, in emerging adulthood, it's more likely to have other sex friendships and that idea of friends with benefits becomes more common um, and friendships become less important when uh, the individual has a romantic relationship. Such an interesting question of peer pressure or selective association. I'm sure we've all heard that term peer pressure, right? Why did you make that bad decision, uh, right? Why did a t an adolescent um, do something that perhaps they shouldn't have done? Was it peer pressure? Um, or this idea of selective association, that's a term you may not have heard before. So adolescent friends tend to have similar levels of um, risky behaviors, things like alcohol use, cigarette use, and substance use. And so is the similarity between peers and adolescents a result of peer pressure, right? Other peers pressuring, an individual to do something, or selective association, meaning whatever that individual's risky behavior level is, they tend to find other people who also um, have that similar level of risky behavior. So there is a correlation between adolescents' report of risk behavior for themselves and their friends. They perceive their friends to be similar to themselves. Um, and there is um, research evidence to show that this selective association is happening, that um, adolescents are tending to look for um, other peers who are similar to them in these behaviors. Um, peer pressure to participate in risk behavior was ranked low in level of influence. So actually the idea of peers pressuring um, an adolescent to do something is ranked pretty low in terms of why a adolescent does some sort of behavior or another. 
Um, but we still do know that peer pressure plays a role, particularly in young adolescents. They conform more to peer standards than children do. And this uh, peak of peer pressure and peer conformity is around eighth or ninth grade. Then between 14 and 18 years of age, um, adolescents start to develop the ability to stand up for what they believe and resist peer pressure, and that becomes of increasing importance. Which adolescents are most likely, most likely to conform to peers? Um, adolescents who are uncertain about their social identity. Um, and conformity also increases when adolescents are in the presence of someone they perceive to have higher status than they do. Um, friends influence the idea of support and nurturance. Um, Thomas Burnt's theory on support. So there's different types of support we can see between friends. Informational support, so giving advice and guidance and solving personal problems instrumental support, help with tasks of various kinds, uh, companionship re support, reliance on each other as companions in social activities, and esteem support, the support friends provide each other by providing um, congratulations for success, encouragement, consolation in failure, etc. What about popularity and rejection? in adolescent peer groups. Um, the chief determinant of popularity during adolescence is social skills. Um, adolescents who have very good social skills, who tend to act appropriately in the eyes of their peers, meet the needs of others, confident but not conceited, those are the characteristics typically of popular um, adolescents. Uh, both boys and girls can be aggressive and popular at the same time. It's kind of interesting that you see those two um, go together quite a bit. Um, and that brings the idea of relational aggression into popularity. Relational aggression is kind of manipulation, uh, maybe telling, starting rumors, uh, manipulating friendships. Those are all types of relational aggression. And we do tend to see some of that in individuals who are popular. Um, and so we can see that kind of relational aggression and popularity um, in the same individual. Um, in terms of boys and girls, we see boys being more physically aggressive than girls. Um, and girls, as I said, act aggressively towards um, can act aggressively toward peers, not only physically, but more often in that relational aggression. And so here's a quote, unlike boys who tend to bully acquaintances or strangers, girls frequently attack within tightly knit friendship networks, making aggression harder to identify and intensifying the damage to the victims. Within the hidden culture of aggression, girls fight with body language and relationships instead of fists and knives. I think that's a great quote and it really shows how even though we think of aggression and bullying um, in the physical way, that relational aggression um, is just as um, devastating, if not more so. All right, um, the nature of adolescent peer groups, cliques versus crowds. So cliques are small groups defined by common activities or just by friendship. So we've known each other for a long time, we're in a clique. Crowds are larger, more vaguely defined groups that are based on reputation. So large groups like these are the jocks in the school, these are the nerds in the school or the brains of the school. Um, and so it's a big, more vaguely descri um, described group and not everybody in that group knows each other. Um, crowds help adolescents locate themselves within the social structure. So very often, middle school, high school, they're large schools. And how do adolescents tend to find their way? Well, they might start to gravitate toward a particular crowd, right? Somebody, groups of people who are similar to them. And teens gravitate toward the crowd that fits their interests and um, disengage from a crowd when its interests deviate or diverge from their own. Distinct 
crowds like goths or brains um, may be a vehicle for helping teens find their own kind in a large anonymous high school. So you can sort of um, maybe remember back to high school and trying to figure out, right, if you were new to high school, I started a brand new high school in ninth grade. How do you find out, you know, who you're going to be friends with? Well, you start, maybe start to gravitate towards people who look, seem to have similar interests than you, these larger crowds. Um, people who are isolated from the in or popular crowd, um, that can lead to unhappiness or um, depression. The structure of cliques and crowds change over time. During adolescence, the structure of crowds becomes more permeable and less hierarchical. So earlier in adolescence, um, people stick very much with their own crowd. Um, and again, think back to your high school years. Um, and then as they develop and make their way towards later adolescence, those crowds become less um, structured. Uh, people start to intermingle more, right? Um, the jocks will maybe hang out with the um, brains, and I'm putting all of that in quotes, right? And people are starting to see themselves, see each other for who they are, as opposed to, as opposed to kind of the crowd they hang out with. Um, so those changes allow adolescents more freedom to start to change crowds, um, change their status, etc. What makes some adolescents popular? So there's a lot of research on popularity, um, sociometry. That's a research methods in which students rate the social status of others. And this starts in, uh, they do this research in elementary school where um, children are given a list of all the names of children in their class and they write who's the most popular, um, kind of rank them all the way to the least popular. Um, and Certainly, there's a lot of this research in adolescence. And so what leads to popularity? We talked about social skills, physical attractiveness, high intelligence. Um, in terms of unpopular adolescence, we've got two categories. Rejected adolescents, those are adolescents who are actively disliked by their peers. Um, versus neglected adolescents, those are adolescents who don't really have any friends, but they're not it's not that they're not liked, they're just pretty much not noticed very much by their peers. Um, social information processing, that's the interpretations of others' behaviors and intentions in a um, social situa situation. And that's really important in terms of um, peers and interacting with uh, other individuals. The way that we process information in a social situation. So as things are happening in the school, um, during the day, um, kind of very neutral things might happen, but some adolescents will process that information um, in a positive way or in a neutral way, whereas some adolescents will process it in a negative way. Um, like if I don't know, somebody bumps into you in the hallway. It was a total accident. So if you process that information as it was an accident, they didn't mean to do it, um, it's a more positive way to process the information versus um, an adolescent who tends to think, why did they bump into me? You know, they must not like me or you know, they must not think I'm important. And so I need to, um, I don't know either get angry at them or feel bad about myself, a more negative type of social information processing. Um, there's also a category of controversial adolescents. Those are adolescents who are aggressive, but also possess social skills. So they evoke strong emotions that are both positive and negative from their peers. So controversial adolescents um, might be very charming, very sociable, but may also be kind of aggressive and um, either manipulative or something like that. And so you get both these very strong positive and negative emotions. Can unpopularity be changed? Um, there are interventions for unpopularity focusing on learning social skills, controlling and managing anger, particularly in that kind of social information processing way and um, teaching individuals to make friends. 
bullying. Um, there's a quote. You can get bullied because you are weak or annoying or because you are different. Kids with big ears get bullied. Dorks get bullied. Teachers' pets get bullied. If you say the right answer in class too many times, you can get bullied. Maybe that brings you back to adolescence where it feels like there's nothing you can do that is totally correct, right? Someone might not like what you do um, no matter what it is. And it can be so difficult um, to be in this adolescent age. So bullying is deliberate victimization of another peer. It can range from verbal insults to social exclusion to physical assaults. Um, it, we've even found that witnessing harassment and bullying can lead to increased anxiety. So just watching somebody else get bullied can increase anxiety. Targets of bullies are typically those who are already near the bottom of the social ladder. Um, they may be, may be withdrawn, depressed, insecure, fearful, physically weak, socially immature. They might have poor social skills. Interesting, having a best friend can protect someone from the negative effects of bullying. One good friend is really important and very protective. Being bullied has been linked to serious and long-lasting problems, including depression, anxiety, loneliness, sadness, anger, poor school performance, poor self-esteem. Bullies tend to be aggressive, hostile, think of themselves as attractive and popular, even though they're actually disliked. Bullies run a greater risk of becoming delinquents, criminals, and substance abusers, but not always. Uh, bullying and victimization reach a peak during the early adolescent years and then decline. And now, of course, we have a whole new type of bullying, cyberbullying, using electronic devices to harass someone with rumors, lies, um, embarrassing truths, threats. Um, these cyberbullying can really um, send these messages to a much larger group of people that can multiply or increase the stress of the person who's being bullied. It's also emotionally easier to conduct. It kind of removes um, or puts a little distance between the person who's doing the bullying and the victim, as opposed to having to say something to someone's face, typing it into a text message or uh, social media app um, is sometimes less difficult. And so it can occur uh, more frequently. All right. Thank you very much, everybody.